Hi everyone and welcome to the ACEDS webinar channel. I am Deja Miller. I am the Operations Specialist here at ACEDS and would love to welcome you here. Today um, we have a wonderful webinar with uh, our affiliate BIA, Preventing Waste Costs and E-Discovery, and um, Maureen is going to go ahead and do the introductions. We are very happy to have this team here with us today. Without further ado, Maureen. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the ACEDS and BIA webinar on Preventing Wasted Costs in E-Discovery. My name is Maureen Murchie, and I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers, Brian Schrader and Barry Schwartz. Brian is BIA's CEO and co-founder and is an attorney with over 20 years of experience in computer forensics, e-discovery, information technology, and the law. Barry is BIA's Vice President of Advisory Services. He oversees all of our experts and advisors and has over 35 years of legal, business consulting, and management experience. As two of BIA's most senior experts, Brian and Barry help our clients design and implement e-discovery workflows and solutions that are not only defensible, but that also help save substantial costs which is what we are here to talk about today. So with no further delay, I'll turn the presentation over to Brian and Barry. The floor is all yours, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maureen, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Brian Schrader. I'll start out here, and Barry and I will toss it back and forth. If you have any questions, you know, make, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, submit those through the uh, webinar application, we have a couple of them that we'll try to answer as we go along, uh, but we do have a, 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 a spot at the end uh, that we'll a attempt to answer as many questions as we can. So um, just wanted to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about today uh, when it comes to saving um, uh, saving money to discovery or preventing wasted costs, however you want to put it. Um, the uh, Some of the things we're going to focus on today are things that you can do regardless of your case size, regardless of um, whether you've got one case or 100 cases. Um, there are obviously things that companies with large litigation profiles and large litigation needs can do um, in addition to these steps like you know, volume purchasing and centralization and things like that we'll touch on a little bit at the end. Uh, but really, the things we're going to focus on today are um, uh, the list of things you see in front of you, creating a legal event team, creating standard protocols, um, the importance of issuing legal uh, litigation holds and how that impacts costs, um, custodian questionnaires and interviews and how that can help you save you money. Um, one of the most important parts we'll talk about is the targeted ESI collections because that can really help uh, reduce the data even before you really even get started in your case. Um, and analytics and, and leveraging project management, saving uh, sums on document review costs through TAR and other uh, processes, and also reducing the cost of document productions as well. So lots of topics to talk about. Hopefully we can get through all of them in an hour, and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with the first one here. Um, and, and even before we get started talking about the, um, the, the first step in that uh, chart, I wanted to mention the e-discovery maturity model because it does – um, uh, impact this discussion a little bit. Uh, if you haven't seen the e-discovery maturity model before, this is um, uh, a model that we came up with many years ago. Uh, it was published on the uh, EDRM, or the Electronic Discovery Reference Model Organization's website uh, as well, and um, that's how that's been taken over by I believe it's Georgetown now, uh, <clears throat> if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but the e-discovery maturity model uh, was is is uh, kind of a standard industry maturity model. You'll see this in everything from, you know, manufacturing to uh, to technology to even processes like this. And what this is designed to do is show organizations kind of how they can um, mature their process internally and the different steps and the different places to focus. Um, and you'll see the last section there is costs. Um, you know the the more organized, the more control, the more kind of mature your, pro your process becomes, you can see there that your costs um, go from surprising uh, to controlled and then and targeted reductions and, and, and uh, sharing costs and spreading that legal spend across the other parts of the organization. Um, and this, this is uh, um, 
we've got a white paper on our website. I believe it's, like I said, still in the EDRM organization's uh, website as well, uh, if you'd like to dig into that. Um, but it can help you decide, you know, where you are today, and as you move up that model, your processes get more defensible, your strategies get more predictable and, and more defensible, your costs get lower. Um, and, uh, and so we'll be talking about some of that today. And so the first thing we want to talk about was the legal event team. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, I know most organizations, the last thing you want is another committee, uh, but it is really, really important, and it's not that hard to do. Whether you're talking about um, a law firm who is managing many clients and advising many clients, or you're within a single organization, the importance of uh, creating a legal event team is, uh, is key to not only uh, making the entire process more seamless and less disruptive and less chaotic, um, but all of those things directly impact costs. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is the place to start. You know, you want to create a legal event team, and the people you want to bring in, uh, we call it as essential as a disaster recovery team. Um, just like you've got a team of people who go into uh, action and create plans and test those plans with respect to disaster recoveries and business continuity in your I IT teams especially, um, having that kind of team where w when the organization or when a client comes in with a new e-discovery need who already is, is assigned already has uh, uh, roles assigned, who's going to do what, decisions are made as to how processes are going to be done. Um, you're not reinventing the, the, uh, uh, reinventing the entire process every single time. Um, the, like I said, the, the key thing is to have a couple of um, both internal and external resources. Internal in organizations would involve legal, IT, HR, executive sponsorship, things along those lines. Outside resources, counsel, vendors, consultants. Um, who's going to be on your team is largely dependent on what your organization looks like um, and uh, and what the approach is. Uh, but it should be rel it should be relatively obvious depending on your your organization uh, who should be on that group um, that team you know when they come together they not only create and select a solution um, and say you know here's how we're going to handle cases from how we're going to issue legal holds to how we're going to collect data to what vendors we're going to use to what our process is to whether or not we're going to use tar or other kind of technologies uh, it's that team who really kind of puts together the workflow um, inside the, that organization or that the law firm uses to, to advise its clients. Um, and then, again, creating repeatable processes that you can always count on. And the key to that is having a, an organized team together in the first place. Um, and again, one of the things is assigning responsibilities there. Who's going to do what? You know, when a case starts, whose job is it to get a legal hold out? Whose job is it to identify custodians? Whose job is it to uh, automatically suspend uh, deletion processes? Um, and so, so the first thing is uh, assemble the team. And so once the team is assembled, um, the next big thing is to write a, to create an internal written plan. And this can be, um, something that goes into extreme detail. We have a, a model plan that we, we supply to our customers um, that is, can range from 10 pages to 50 pages, depending on uh, you know, how complex in, of an environment we're talking about and how large litigation profiles are and what kind of solutions are out there. But having an internal written plan, even something that is basic as taking the steps of the electronic discovery reference model, um, or the EDRM, and saying, okay, the first step that's shown in there that we need to do is identify custodians. How are we going to do that? You know, the next step is issuing a legal hold. How are we going to do that? Is it going to be emails and tracking with spreadsheets? Are we going to decide on a piece of software to use? Um, what's the solution? Having all that stuff planned and checklists uh, created well before a case happens, not only uh, does do you not again reinvent the wheel every time? You are uh, you'll start seeing substantial savings because once you have that plan uh, and once you have a standardized approach with anything in business, uh, standardized approaches where it's a repeatable, reliable process um, will always reduce your cost your cost across the board. And as you implement that and you start following that checklist as you go through a couple of matters, you'll start recognizing places 
where inefficiencies exist and, and you'll craft that plan a little bit better, a little bit tighter, maybe adjust some of your approaches. Without that written plan, you're, you're, you may have institutional knowledge. Um, somebody was involved in the last litigation, so now they're involved in the next litigation. They remember how they did it the last time. Um, but you're not really ever going to be able to truly control your costs uh, because without a, without a clear game plan, you're, you're always jumping into chaos, and chaos will always increase costs. Um, and so these are some of the different things uh, that that plan should cover. Responsibilities, who does what, when, where, and why. Uh, again, follow the EDRM you know, every step along the way. Um, you want to spell out uh, the custodian involvement, meaning exactly how are you going to do legal holds. Our custodian questionnaire is something you're going to use. We'll talk about that in a little bit and how that can help you drastically reduce costs. Um, and also uh, building in attorney guidance and supervision creating protocols, creating a collection strategy, how our custodian interview is going to be conducted, um, and very, very important uh, focusing on how to create a reasonable schedule at the very beginning of the case because um, that's also uh, something we'll talk about here in a minute is the more you can prepare for a case in advance – um, and the more you can uh, get started on, on some of the early steps in a process early on in, in the overall uh, lifespan of a, of a case, um, the, the lower your costs are going to be. Uh, the worst thing you can do is wait until there's 60, 90 days left in, in any discovery or discovery plan uh, and start at that point because you'll just it, – it, the old saying is you can get stuff done uh, um, uh, good, quick, and cheap. Pick any two. So if you need it quick and and good, you're not going to get it cheap. Um, and so uh, what we, you know, these plans will help you get uh, a head start and will help make sure that the process itself isn't rushed along the way. Um, and then, of course, one of the other big things that the team should create is a standard e-discovery protocol. Um, and by protocol, I mean there's kind of two different things we're talking about here. There's a written plan, meaning, okay, here's the checklist. We got a new case. What's our first step? Identify custodians, issue legal holds, things of that nature. What we're talking about here is more about the e-discovery protocol that you should enter in to with your opposing party, uh, with the opposing counsel. Um, one of the best ways to make sure, again, that you're controlling costs and that you're in control of the process is to be the first one to step up and say, here is our standard e-discovery protocol um, that we'd like both parties to sign as part of the initial um, uh, meet and confers at the beginning of cases. Uh, if you're the one who comes with that protocol and says, look, this is the protocol we've used in the last 5, 10, 15 cases, whatever the, ca whatever, uh, the case may be, um, you're going to be much better prepared and much more in control of that process. And by establishing that, you're going to establish from the very outset certain things like, you know, uh, can we prioritize custodians and focus on the top 10 first, for example, maybe? Um, can we, uh, you know, we, we focus in on how productions are going to be made? Doing some documents native, some TIFF, whatever. There are lots of ways to control costs there. Uh, how are you going to handle deduplication? Can you handle, is it going to be kind of basic deduplication where if one custodian has two copies of something, you only get one copy? Or can you do cross-custodian where it's the whole organization and if there's 50 people in the organization that got a document, you only have to produce one of them and how that's going to work. Um, email threading, is there something that you can uh, – um, uh, it, can you enter into, into an agreement where, for example, uh, you use the most inclusive email in a thread and produce that instead of all the individual emails? There's a lot of stuff you can do in a standard discovery protocol that can help you control costs. There's also a lot you can do in that standard discovery protocol that can help you uh, prevent potential uh, uh, pitfalls. So, for example, um, you know you can create uh, – uh, or you should have a section that talks about clawbacks that – is is explicit and allows for basically any party to claw back uh, data that they might have accidentally produced in inadvertent productions, uh, be it privilege or, or whatever. Um, you can cover that kind of stuff as well. And the more you have this stuff in writing, the less you have to worry about how uh, the magistrate or the uh, or the judge or whoever is is uh, uh, overseeing the process 
you know, might interpret what the federal rules say or what your local rules say with respect to e-discovery, because in most cases, if the parties come together and say, this is how we're going to conduct e-discovery, it's a written agreement that covers everything from how we're going to decide which custodians to how we're going to do keyword searching or TAR or whatever kind of calling that we're going to do, what that process looks like, what the production formats are going to look like. If you cover all the basic stuff, and again, this is a standard document that you could just reuse and customize for each step. Um, you, you drastically reduce the potential for any misunderstandings or worst case sanctions that might result uh, from somebody not liking what you're doing. If you, you know, you could agree to produce all the documents on, on carved stone tablets if you wanted to uh, in an agreement, at the end of the day, that agreement in most cases will trump um, a lot of the local rules. We've seen things, for example, before where companies uh, have wanted to do native productions, but they, you know, uh, or demanded a native production after they had already gotten a TIFF production, and the courts have come back and said, well, you know, look, you agreed in a stipulation to a TIFF production. That was the format everybody agreed from the outset. You know, uh, um, you're not going to get you're not going to get your own uh, a new changed process now. Um, so again, having all this stuff from the organization and creating a clear group of people whose responsibility it is to come up with a plan, having a plan document that not only talks about what you're going to do internally and literally a checklist step by step, um, to having this written protocol uh, that you share with your opposing counsel, you, you negotiate it, and you come to clear terms on all the key aspects of any discovery process, this, it all kind of falls under the idea of planning around e-discovery. And as we all know, and, and there's, there's uh, no better way to start any new process than with clear and comprehensive planning. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that takes forever. The first time you put a plan together, sure, that's going to take a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, depending on how often the team meets. But once that plan is in place, most of our clients who have these plans meet either once or twice a year, review the protocols, talk about cases that might have happened and things that where they might see better ways of doing things because technology and solutions are always changing. Um, uh, and that's about it. And just update those protocols as you go along. In the first case or two, you'll find that you'll smooth everything out. You'll get bumps in the road taken care of. You'll find the best way that wor things work in your organization. And essentially what you're doing here is turning e-discovery from a completely chaotic um, uh, unpredictable process into just another business process. And, and really, if you walk away with nothing else from this uh, uh, discussion, if you walk away with the understanding that what we're talking about here to a large degree is is just that. It's about looking at e-discovery as, as just another business process, just like you would look at, you know, how do you handle new customer orders all the way from acquisition through to fulfillment. Uh, you have plans for everything else like this in your organization. Uh, e-discovery should really be no different. And if you really want to get controls over, over the costs, it's all about planning in advance. Um, so that being said, let's dive into some of the stuff that actual, that uh, some of the actual steps of that process and, and hints is how to save costs along the way. Uh, the first th thing on that is the legal hold uh, and uh, custodian questionnaires. And I will take a, a brief moment and let you hear the dulcet tones of Barry Schwartz. Barry, take it away. Uh, dulcet tones. Thank you, Brian. Um, as Brian shared early on in our presentation, the e-discovery maturity model, we have our legal hold maturity model, which is not a whole lot unlike the e-discovery model. It starts with an ad hoc chaotic approach all the way up to an integrated and optimized approach. And again, the steps to get from level one to level five um, involve planning and experience and knowledge and um, awareness of what you as an organization need to do in order to have a, a process in place for managing uh, the very one of these very important processes in a litigation matter, and that is preserving the data. And how do you preserve the data? How do you make sure that the data is properly um, being um, preserved is to issue a, a legal hold and follow that through to its logical end, which is the end of a matter. And so, again, on the level one, we have an ad hoc, creative, uh, chaotic process, which is, well, we're going to issue a legal hold by email. We're going to send it out and we're going to try to track it in some kind of meaningful way. And as we move up the chain to a repeatable uh, um, process, it means we've probably done it once or twice before, 
And so we're going to do what we did previously. And then we see most of our clients in the three and four level where there is a standardized process. There, there are, there is a repeatability between matters. There's the use of, um, of uh, personnel in some controlled fashion. And as we move up to semi-automated and very integrated automated, um, we start to see significant cost savings for our clients. And as Brian was saying, the goal here, again, is to gain efficiency, repeatability, and te- defensibility, and hence you have cost savings. And again, it's a process. How do you do these things? So the, the manual approach is, as I, I said earlier, um, with email notifications probably tracked in a spreadsheet or uh, um, perhaps even in an Outlook uh, voting system, which is not the best way to do things. And the, the manual approach is really in our parlance levels one and two. And as we move up the chain with legal hold solution software, um, we have the ability to automate notifications and reminders so that the, the um, system knows when to send after you've set it up correctly, a, a reminder to custodians that either A, they haven't acknowledged that they are on hold and what the responsibilities and obligations are, up to reminders to remind them along the way over time that they continue to be on a legal hold and that their obligations to preserve um, documents and data remains until the, the item is released. And, you know, the more automated systems have the ability to send out releases to custodians so that they know that they are no longer on a hold and also have the ability to integrate with HR systems such as PeopleSoft and with the IT department who needs to know which uh, data resources can uh, be remediated or repurposed as we have exiting employees who may or may not be on a legal hold. And then, um, as Brian mentioned as well, custodian questionnaires are an excellent way to learn about the matter at hand. Um, And many times uh, they're integrated with legal holds so that it all happens in one easy, smooth step. And and here, um, the, the best way to learn about what information may be out there, who may be involved, and again, we're talking efficiency, is to discuss with your custodians who will know where the data is and will know, presumably, who else in the organization may or may not have information pertaining to uh, the matter at hand. And we always recommend to add in a question, a stop question, that allows people who you think might be custodians to say, well, I may know something about this, but I really wasn't involved. I don't have any data or um, information pertaining to the matter. So I'm really not somebody that you you want to pursue further uh, for detailed information regarding this, this matter. And at that point in time, the questionnaire stops, the custodian saves time. You don't get a lot of, um, meaningless or less than complete answers because the custodian doesn't have that knowledge. And you can always, we we think you can trust the custodians to do the right thing. And as Brian was discussing with um, institution of a legal event team, one of the things that that team is um, typically charged with is educating uh, the employee base that if and when a legal event happens and there is the need to issue a legal hold, and you have the need to inquire of uh, employees what they may or may not know, if they're keyed in that they've got this responsibility, when they receive a legal hold, receive a custodian questionnaire, they, they take it in the right light, they take it seriously, they respond promptly, and they respond with complete, as complete answers as they possibly can provide. And also, you don't want to be in the position of answering to the court where you say, well, I didn't, I didn't ask the people involved where they kept their most important documents. Uh, th- that is really a, a, a problem waiting to happen if you don't have the ability to ask 
uh, your custodians these questions. Uh, other things that the custodians can provide in their answering is to identify the more difficult data locations that uh, you don't want to miss, such as I use my home computer. I've used non-work email accounts when I've been stuck and away from the office. I've discussed something on social media. I've used mobile devices or cloud storage um, resources such as Box or uh, Dropbox or things of that sort. And also, the custodians can identify databases and other repositories. And we've seen in several cases where uh, a, a long-term custodian remembers, oh, we used this system a long time ago, it was retired, but I think there's still data around from that that we, we should look at for this particular matter. So um, it's important to start um, with the key custodians and do those interviews. They, it's typically you know, two, three, four individuals in an organization uh, where you can do a phone or in-person interview. It helps you narrow the focus of your investigation. It also helps identify some of the more critical players, uh, potential custodians, and the data resources that may exist within the organization. Um, that's an efficient use of time with inefficiency, again, translates into cost savings in doing your interviews in that manner. But as you move beyond the, the handful of key custodians, you may have 20 or 30 or 40 additional custodians, and that becomes a huge cost sink um, if you're trying to interview each of those in, in a manual uh, process, phone or in person. So with the custodian questionnaire, you can identify your custodians. Uh, you, you can avoid that cost of interviewing all of them, and you can gather uh, your your information much more quickly and in a reportable uh, format where all, all the answers are accumulated in a document and you can scan down the columns to see which custodians answered in which way. And it, it's a very uh, meaningful, efficient, and um, cost-saving event to use a custodian questionnaire. And remember that um, in, in addition to just having a custodian questionnaire, you can have a variety of questionnaires depending on who your audience is. You don't have to issue these um, just at the time you issue a legal hold. As a case develops and you learn more information, you've collected additional data, and now you have a whole additional set of questions you want to ask, you can vary the questions depending on who your audience is. It could be one set of questions for engineers, another set of questions for, for the marketing team. And we have a, a case citation here. Council must affirmatively act to communicate with the client to identify all sources of information. And that, that, that's a, an ethical requirement, and it's also a practical requirement. And Brian, up to you. All right, well, thank you. And so, you know, just to kind of build on um, uh, as we're going through the process here, so first we're talking about the teams um, and how that just kind of being organized and having workflows and having defined things helps reduce your costs. The one thing about legal holds um, that is is really interesting to me is that not only do the legal holds just a requirement from the outset, a lot of the uh, um, uh, sanctions couldn't think of the word. Uh, a lot of the sanctions you see today come around not issuing proper legal holds. So the best way to avoid that and therefore save those costs is to make sure you've got a process in place for it. The custodian questionnaires are key to be able to narrow down to where's the right information, who are the right people, and get rid of all the fluff, right? And so as we're moving through the process, the overall goal here is to, is to continually narrow down what you're looking at as early as you possibly can. So, you know, when you're looking at custodian questionnaires, like Barry said, one of the best things to do there is you're, you're, you are eliminating people and you're eliminating solu uh, potential data sources uh, just from asking questions and having the conversations. Like Barry said, you talk to somebody who got added to a list of custodian questionnaires for the you know, uh, ABC widget, and they say, I don't even know what the ABC widget is, let alone ever been involved in the design or sale of, the, of that widget. And you can get rid of them right away before they ever go into collections, before they, you know, data collections, before they ever go down the process. And so 
the the kind of grand theme I want to uh, focus, and especially as we get into this next section, is this idea of uh, and the EDRM itself kind of shows you this in its diagram. As you move through the process, the process itself should be designed to try to narrow in on what is really important to the case and get rid of as much fluff as possible. Um, and uh, uh, the next step in that process is legal data collection and preservation. So we talked about legal holds and telling people uh, not to delete data, IT um, task suspension, I touched on that a little bit. Um, and using the custodian questionnaires to identify, help identify potential solu uh, uh, sources, because we're not just talking about, um, you know, email and desktops. We're now talking about potentially, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Dropbox and Evernote and a million other different apps that are out there that might be uh, potentially brought in. So now that we're talking about ESI, uh, gathering all that ESI, how do we go about doing that? Well. One of the best things you can do is start with some early data analytics. Uh, call it EDA, call it whatever you want, uh, early case analysis, some people call it. One thing's for certain, there are no shortage, shortage of acronym, uh, acronyms in this industry. But the whole point here is there are tools out there. Um, we use Total Discovery to do this. There are other tools out there that can do it as well that will scan uh, custodians. And whether you do it to all the different custodians or you just do it to a couple of select custodians to get an idea of what the data universe looks like, having an early idea of you know, what kinds of data you're looking at and what kinds of data the custodians are holding on to can help you target later collections. Um, and really that's what I'm talking about here in, in this data collection step is how do you get to targeted collections? Stop the, the you know, when we first got into this industry back in, oh, I would first jumped in in the, in the late 90s um, and, and then BIA was founded in 2002. At that point, everybody was imaging hard drives. And one of the reasons we started BIA was because we thought that was crazy. You would never walk into your office or your client's office or, or go to a custodian's desk and just blindly copy every piece of paper in the room or in the building. That's what imaging hard drives was. You were copying tons of data. Usually 90% or more of the data getting collected on a hard drive image was completely useless and a waste of time. And so right there with targeted collections, and by targeted collections we generally mean, um, depending on the case, it could be targeting certain types of information, but at the very least, targeting just user-created data and eliminating all the fluff that comes with the forensic image from the very outset, you can limit your data source, or you can reduce your data source right at the very first step by 90%. And you can imagine what that does to the rest of the process, because the less garbage in, the, the, you can drastically reduce your costs across the board. And that that means not only the cost of, of data collection, data storage, hosting, processing, document review, every step along the way gets cheaper. And so if you, you know, if there's one thing that you walk away from this and you want to implement, I know I said earlier it was the, the planning, which is really important too, um, but focusing collections to the most potentially relevant data. Now, you know, that doesn't mean cross the line and get overly selective on a collection. Um, but what it does mean is you can, there are tools out there now, and there's a lot of different ones that can, uh, um, at, you know, target in and say, I just want to collect all the user files, the Word docs, the spreadsheets, the emails, that kind of stuff. It ignore the system files, ignore all the Slack space and free space. You don't need any of that. You're not required to collect any of that. So why do it in the first place? Um, and we tell clients all the time, look, if you're talking about some sort of a, of a criminal investigation or if you have a custodian who you think has been deleting data, then sure, go ahead and, uh, and do an image of that person's hard drive or those resources uh, because you may want to do an investigation. But absent bad activities or absent, good, absent a good faith belief that there's problems like that, there's no legal requirement to go overboard. There's no legal requirement to, to uh, restore deleted data, for example. As long as, it, as long as data was maintained in the proper course and as long as you had a legal hold out there um, and you, you stopped any automatic policies, there's no reason to go beyond that to extraordinary measures absent significant showings uh, in, in a court that, that that would be necessary. 
Um, and so how do you go about doing that? First off, like I said, you can do this data analytics. This, again, we use the total discovery tools for a lot of this stuff. Um, and uh, that tool allows you to send out a little app to custodians. They run on their computer. They don't have to install anything. It's just if they can run WebEx or something, they can run that. So it's really easy to do. And we get back reports like this. And we can look at it and say, oh, these custodians have a lot of video files. Is there any reason we need to collect those? No, this case has nothing to do with video. Okay, we can exclude that from the outset. Uh, things like that, for example. We can we can target in on, on the types of data. It helps with budgeting. It helps with yearly negotiations. And it really, really is a great way to, to start controlling the amount of data you're getting in the first place. Um, and now the the uh, the next big thing is the collection process, right? We uh, the legacy approaches I talked about a little bit, uh, the old fashioned drag and drop. This we don't see this as much today as we did in the very beginning, but that destroys metadata and all sorts of different problems. Um, and and it's just not a great process uh, to follow at all. We just bring it up because we still do see see some people do that, where they just tell custodians, oh yeah. You know, drop all your files in this network share or on this Dropbox account or whatever the case may be. Um, really bad idea. All sorts of potentials for sanctions and increased costs. You're going to have to go back and redo the process if if somebody objects to it, and it's, and it's going to really, really uh, drastically increase the time and the costs involved. Uh, enterprise software. If you've got uh, an enterprise um, uh, need for that, if you're doing a lot of data collections, it's a great way to help control some of your costs and help to target down collections. Uh, it can get expensive to, to deploy, uh, and it's a little bit costly to maintain those be kind of behind the firewall systems. Uh, the more uh, um, modern cloud stuff we'll talk about here in a sec, uh, but that's a way to, to, to look at it. It's a little bit cheaper than doing full forensic images uh, probably, but it's still, rather expensive and, and a bit of a beast to maintain. Um, the uh, and, I, and, I, and I won't go into the forensic collection stuff. You know, I, we, we do a lot of computer forensics here at BI. I don't want a, anybody to walk away from this who might be a forensics technician and be upset that I said it's not, that there's no value to it. I'm not saying that at all. There is value to forensic collections. Just shouldn't be your default go-to method for collections um, because it just does result in a lot more data travel costs and shipping costs and all sorts of other things as well. Uh, and it generally takes a lot longer to do. So um, try to avoid these legacy approaches. Uh, they're very expensive. It'll, it'll increase your costs. So what are the more modern approaches? Well, we're talking about cloud collections. There's a lot of tools out there. Not a lot of tools. There are several tools out there that do it. DiscoveryBot is part of the total discovery platform that we use to do it. Um, uh, but we have other solutions we use as well. Uh, you know, we have a whole toolkit here that we yeah, uh, that, that has a lot of different tools, but they're all uh, cloud-based and they're all very secure. You know, a lot of people ask us about, uh, you know, well, cloud is that secure? We hear about data breaches all the time. Well, yeah, if you f select a system that is encrypting the data as it's getting it collected, so that it's it's highly encrypted uh, from the very outset, then you're never going to have any problems. Even if somebody were to break into a storage array, um, they still couldn't read the data because it's all encrypted. Uh, so as long as you're doing something like that, this is the absolute best way. And it doesn't take, um, uh, I, I just paint the picture. The, when we first got into this industry, if I needed to collect data from a custodian, we'd send out a forensic technician, we'd go on site, we'd pull the hard drive out of their computer half the time, snap it into a machine, couple hours, the custodian is there, the employee sitting there twiddling their thumbs, losing uh, you know, efficiencies in the business, taking a whole lot of time. And, and even when as that process gets a little bit better and you don't have to take out the drive anymore, it's still very disruptive to the custodian. It still takes a lot of time and still has a lot of high costs. Whereas the modern approach, and again, there are a couple of different solutions out there that do this, Literally, the custodian gets an email, they click on a button, maybe they spend a minute or two, um, you know, selecting some files if you want them to. There's different ways of doing it. Um, but then they go about their business and these tools run in the background. They collect the data, they encrypt it, they upload it up into the cloud into a secure platform where it gets processed, and immediately that stuff becomes searchable and available to you. Compared to the old method of Sending somebody out on site, collecting that data, bringing it back, putting it into one system to, to pull out the data, putting it into another one so you can index it and search it, putting it into another one to review. Just the simple fact of having that unified solution across the board that literally you could collect from 200 custodians in a day uh, with with 
um, uh, with only a minute or two of, of actual distraction of those individuals, the soft cost savings, let alone the savings you get from those targeted collections, not collecting all sorts of junk you don't need in the first place, is a huge way to reduce your costs uh, in the process. This is, you know, 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% savings across the board by using targeted remote collections as opposed to the old pro process. So um, if you can't tell, we're a big, big, big proponent of the targeted collections. So, uh, and again, this is just some of the reasons you avoid employee disruptions, you avoid over collections, you don't have to go back and recollect data over and over again, you don't have a lot of unnecessary IT costs, you can definitely avoid sanctions if you're doing it the right way. Um, and uh, you can avoid e increased e discovery costs that come just from being able to reduce that data set. Um, and uh, so now that you've collected all your data, uh, the next step is to review that data. And when we're talking about review, uh, basically in, in that processing and review comes a lot of technologies and a lot of analytics. Uh, and I think uh, this is where I will hand it back to Barry to talk a little bit about this. Thanks again, Brian. Um, as you can see, we, we've listed out, uh, I think, six different areas of technology considerations here. And the first one is eliminating duplicates across your data set. Not only exact duplicates within custodian sets or within a custodian, but exact duplicates across custodians as, as well as near duplicates. Um, if you don't have to review the duplicates over and over and over again, you're obviously saving costs. Near duplicates can be identified through um, some of the technology platforms that are available, whether it be brain-based relativity or Catalyst Predict software. Um, all, all these tools have that kind of capability, and it's an important consideration as you're, you're looking at ways to control your document review costs. Email threading is the notion that you're reviewing only the most inclusive email in in a thread, so that if you if there are ten sub emails to to that thread and um, you don't need to inter to review items uh, two through nine or or ten, where you just reviewed the top email, and that allows for a more consistent and uh, efficient document review, and obviously it reduces the time involved in in completing your document review. Uh, file filtering allows for the elimination of clearly irrelevant files. There could be logos that um, sneak through the processing engine just because of the nature of how they're embedded or not embedded in files. You can uh, reduce uh, fil files uh, such as sports betting and other irrelevant things that may have been caught up through your, your, your searching prior to loading to a document review platform. But you also do need to be careful not to overly filter and be mindful of what your date restrictions are in a, in a given matter. And then we also have the ability to use conceptual analytics. Who's talking to whom? Um, which is, is an important thing. If you have a concept, uh, somebody is, um, has entered into an agreement and you want to know what the backstory is regarding the creation of that agreement, you can identify again, who's talking to whom through the use of uh, communications tracking uh, tools. And then, you know, we, we've talked several times today, mentioned it several times today, regarding technology-assisted review. There are quite a few options. I, I mentioned the three lead ones of brain space relativity and Catalyst Predict, um, but you need to be sure that you've picked the right tool for the situation at hand and the, the critical thing here is, and this is where huge cost savings come into play, and that's in having a subject matter expert who is intimately familiar with the case at hand, with the issues that you know exist within um, the prosecution or defense of your claims, and is able to lend that insight in um, educating the, the technology assisted review platforms at the at the most detailed and, and highest level. And it's important that when you're doing technology assisted review, that you have uh, at your at your right hand a certified uh, solution expert for the platform that you're utilizing. And you know, we have here mentioned the top tip. Don't forget that 
these review platforms, these technology assisted review platforms can be used to review opposing and third party uh, productions as well. Did the opposing party produce all the documents that you think they should have produced? Has their production been deficient or not? And uh, another area that we can use and we have used successfully in, in, in many matters is doing the privilege review to identify privilege documents, make certain that the privilege calls are correct and consistent. And um, that way, when you're producing your privilege log, it is um, as correct as it possibly can be. And we, we had a, an early question about project managers. Um, and how, how you how you key in a, a project manager from the outset, and remember that project managers aren't um, just order takers; they they are the critical glue in your team to make certain that the bullet points here that we have budgets, timelines, coordination, solution identification, protocol development, and following are indeed done. Um, and remember that in most matters there are really three project managers. There's the client's project manager who may be responsible for corralling the custodians and assisting with the um, data collection and so forth. Um, there's also a project manager within the law firm who is typically, a, these days we see it to be a paralegal or, a, a, or an associate. And then of course there's the vendor's project manager who is there to make certain that things flow as um, smoothly as they possibly can. And, and one, one of the keys that we like to discuss here at PIA is to have consistent personnel matter over matter. Um, as we're, we're a vendor in the space and our project managers learn our, our clients' nuances and it, it is a huge cost saver for our clients and we, we presume for yours as well, that a project manager who has this institutional knowledge, it, the learning curve for new matters is, is much, much slower, uh, much, much uh, quicker, I'm sorry. And again, we go back to, um, now we'll talk about document review costs and so forth. The key here is, as we said right along today, is the process of preparing and planning. Um, take your time, create the right protocol, um, plan, 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 and make sure that your protocol is, is correct and, and appropriate for the matter at hand. And one, one thing that uh, we're very cautious about is tracking changes in review protocols. As a, a case evolves, um, notions of what's responsive, what's not responsive, what is a key issue, what isn't a key issue, change over time, and it's important to know when those changes happen because it may be necessary to go back and make some coding changes along the way. And, of course, in document review, which is a very expensive process, consider your, your technology assistive review options. Again, TAR isn't always the best solution, but in the appropriate matters, it can reduce your costs and provide a, a, a more efficient and perhaps even a better result than linear manual review. And again, going along with what I said just a, a second or two ago regarding project managers, consider developing a dedicated core review, review team that has team leads that are familiar with um, your client's matters or your matters so that the institutional knowledge transfers from matter to matter to matter. And with that, uh, I'll turn this back to Brian, who can uh, provide some discussion on production cost savings. Thank you, Barry. So, yeah, this is the last step in the in the uh, process. Always is producing documents, um, and uh, while document productions um, have become pretty standardized, um, they. Uh, um, uh, there are ways to still save potentially significant costs there. So again, um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, plan, 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 plan. Right? It's it's always better, you know. Like Barry mentioned, even with document review, you know, I can't tell you um, how many times we have clients who just want to jump in and start doing the review, and we warn and say, look, 
let's let's take a day, talk about it, develop a protocol, get the team leaders on the phone with the with council and and really talk through the requests and what the case is about and make sure everybody's on the same page because if you don't do that you're just going to end up repeating things you know and that's kind of uh, something that applies to everything if you don't have a plan in place at the very beginning, you're going to end up re- repeating things. If you don't have a production protocol in place, you might end up producing a lot of documents and then having to redo it all over again because something wasn't done correctly or the other side objected and there was not a decision to begin with. So have a plan in place when it comes to document productions. Have a clear protocol that you've decided. Even if if you, if you enter into a production or to a e-discovery protocol with the opposing counsel, and it, even if you don't include stuff like clawbacks and and litigation holds and how custodians are going to be done and how searching is going to be done and whether or not TAR is going to be there, if nothing else, at least agree in advance exactly what your productions are going to look like. Are they going to be natives or TIFFs? Are there certain documents that you produce certain ways? Uh, what metadata fields? You know, what's the format? PDF, TIFF, whatever. Um, having all that stuff. Uh, um, settled before you do your first production is going to help make sure that you don't have to repeat those costs or repeat those steps and increase your costs across the way. Um, uh, the other thing we always tell people is start early. There's no reason why you can't start producing documents relatively early once review has started. You can, you know, even within a f- the first week or two of review, you can identify some documents for production and start doing rolling productions over time. You, if you wait to the end of a case, you're going to complicate everything. You're going to just dealing with massive amounts of data and transferring it and getting it all set up just takes a lot more time than people often think. Because it's not just copying data off of relativity onto a hard drive. You got to tiff everything out. You got to bait stamp everything. You got to you know pull out all the metadata. You got to build the actual production files. And all of that just takes time, and it's a, a lot of it's just machine time. You're clicking some buttons and waiting for the machine to do the work, uh, but it still takes time to do it. And so rolling productions are a great way to start out, and, and you even start that with a tiny little production of 100 or 1,000 documents in your very first production. And the whole purpose of that is to make sure that everybody uh, agrees, yes, this matches the protocol, yes, this works for us, no tweaks are needed to be made. And so you're not creating some massive production that you have to go back and redo because it didn't have the right uh, uh, um, confidentiality stamps on it or whatever the case may be. So there's some great ways to do that. Again, uh, the key to e-discovery across the board is to start as early in the process as possible, and that goes for every step, including productions. Um, And not only that, Anytime, if you ever talk to anybody who deals with data, they'll tell you that dealing with a lot of small data sets when you're transferring data especially is often going to be a lot easier, a lot cheaper, and a lot faster. If you're doing rolling productions every week or so, you can usually do those productions uh, and deliver them via FTP. You don't have to you know, have hard drives and CDs and DVDs floating all over the place um, that although are going to be encrypted, you know, if you're doing it on a rolling basis and you're doing smaller productions, everything is going to move faster. You can save shipping costs. You can save media costs. Um, and while those aren't huge costs in the end of the day, they are costs, and they're, on a, and they're avoidable easily. So um, uh, if you follow those processes, you'll, you'll help reduce those costs across the board. Um, consider alternative production forms. Now, it depends on your vendor. Some vendors, uh, everybody kind of charges differently for productions. Um, but uh, one of the things that we always encourage our clients to do is uh, to do native productions for a lot of file types, like spreadsheets especially. is you know Spreadsheets, audio files, video files obviously can't be pr- tiffed out, databases, things that were never really meant to be dealt with on paper. Um, should just be produced natively, and uh, and and it's going to save money. It's not only going to save money in creating the production sets, but this is one thing a lot of people don't think about. You can save a lot of money in your hosting costs down the road, and and you're dealing with all sorts of this data if you're just getting a native file. You know, a native Excel file might be a couple of kilobytes, where if you convert it to TIFF, it may turn into 10,000 TIFF pages that's going to take up gigs of data. And so you're using up a lot more data for no reason. 
because nobody's ever going to use the tiffed out versions of the spreadsheets when they're actually looking at stuff. Um, uh, it's just too difficult. So, uh, so there's native productions. You can do summary reporting. We have a lot of clients who you know have to do data collections from big databases like a transactional system, or in HR cases, you might have a wage and hour where you have to analyze a lot of check in and check out stuff. See if you can negotiate with the other side the ability to produce summary reports because a lot of times the detail doesn't matter. What matters is the summaries is are the reports you can run off of those systems and it can be a great way to reduce the costs when you get into the complex e-discovery areas of of large enterprise database productions um, if you can avoid that so for example instead of producing your whole financial system can you report can you produce reports from it uh, and that goes for any kind of larger system as well um, some comp some um, uh, uh, um, in some cases, there's even the possibility of a shared repository. At the very least, if you've got multiple uh, um, parties on one side or the other, you can enter into you know joint agreements where you all use one solution and one hosting uh, 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 repository. And you can even, in a lot of these repositories, depending on the solution you choose, you can have individual access. You know, every uh, every firm or every individual party can have kind of their own notes and comments but they're all pointing to the same document and the same metadata, and so you're paying, imagine a case with 10 defendants. You can either have 10 different databases or you can have one that everybody shares, but they each have their ability to keep private notes and information as well. Um, I've even seen it where uh, in some very large litigations, you have a shared repository uh, between, between all the parties in the case, um, although uh, admittedly that's much more rare. Uh, but those are some of the things you can think about. Uh, and again, you know, we talked about some of the other cost-saving tips, and th these bleed into the production as well, as far as cross-custodian deduplication, most inclusive email production, uh, and also to the extent you can reuse data from one case to another, which is a whole topic on, onto itself, um, uh, that will help you save costs. So, um, I, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and answer some questions, but just, you know, to kind of highlight what we're talking about here, uh, taking it back to the original list, you know, just the the kind of big takeaways I hope that everybody got today was number one is planning, 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 planning. It, you know, taking the time, getting started early, even creating plans in advance where you're creating a legal event team and you're developing your standard protocols. Um, that will go immensely uh, to saving your costs. Uh, it will it will have a probably the largest impact on costs across the board, just because it'll give you a chance to select the best solutions, to select the things that work for you, and not have utter chaos, which is what a lot of e-discovery cases end up being. Um, and then, you know, identifying the right people, using legal holds the right way, making sure you're issuing a legal hold so you don't get sanctioned just for that. Um, and, and, but then utilizing those and utilizing the custodian questionnaire process to really focus in on who are the right people and where is their data. Um, then, you know, targeting that data for collection, using analytics to take care of that, uh, not only to eliminate some of the data for review, but also in the right cases, uh, utilizing TAR uh, in, the, in the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, John Trinetic at Catalyst did a great blog post in a series on the chicken cases. If you haven't uh, heard about that, do, the, do a Google search for TAR for chickens. Talks about how they did uh, the, the um, how they actually went about using TAR in that case. So the big broiler chicken uh, litigations that's been going on. Um, and they talk about how having, you know, it, your individual resources, having a, having a really, really knowledge, knowledgeable person doing some of the review for technology-assisted review, coupled with a, somebody who really understands the technology, those two individuals are going to cost you a lot more money per hour than uh, a kind of a standard document reviewer who's just going dock by dock. But you'll need two of those people instead of a team of 20, 30, 50, 100 reviewers. Uh, and chances are, in the right cases, uh, their results are going to be better and more reliable, and your overall costs, yes, the two, the two individuals working are higher by the hour, but you're paying for two people and not 30, uh, and, you're and you're talking a smaller amount of time. So that really controls costs. Uh, and then again, the production side of things. So I hope you see that these are some of the low-hanging fruit things. Some of them are easy to implement, uh, like 
targeted collections. Some are a little more difficult to implement, like technology-assisted review. But these are the places where you're going to find the most uh, significant cost savings. The other flip side um, is, you know, once you – for organ large organizations – there's other things to talk about as far as um, uh, data reuse and, and some of the uh, uh, larger enterprise systems and volume pricing and, and various things that you can go after. Um, that's kind of for people on the high end of the maturity uh, uh, scale that we looked at before as far as their processes. These, I hope everybody sees, can be implemented um, by just about anybody. Um, and so with that being said, there's a couple of questions. Uh, let me answer... Um, one of them here because um, uh, as I was talking about targeted collections, uh, one of our uh, uh, listeners asked, does the collection software, meaning, re uh, sorry, remote collection software, does it work with custodians connected via VPN or a public Wi-Fi? It can. Um, the, the answer there is it depends. Uh, the uh, you know, it depends on what solution you're using. The solutions we do, uh, we've actually had somebody collect a couple of pieces of data, a couple of files, while they were uh, thirty, you know, thirty-five thousand feet in the air on a plane, uh, using a, a Wi-Fi on a, on a plane. Of course, it was a small collection because those connections are slow in speed, uh, but you can collect from just about anywhere, um, and you can collect remote machines. You can do all sorts of different things. It depends on the data collection software you're using to get really specific on some of it, uh, but it is absolutely possible. Um, and I know we're going a little bit over. We'll continue to, to go through some of these questions uh, for the next couple of minutes. Please feel free to stay on, but we'll also post questions and answers on our blog uh, following up in the next couple of days as well. Um, so uh, the next question is, is there any, and this is a great question, is there any risk that a standardized internal discovery protocol could be subject to discovery, or would it be privileged or work product? Um, it's an, that's a really interesting question. In most cases, it would be considered a privileged and work product because you're probably going to have uh, counsel re, um, uh, involved in that process that would make it attorney-client work product. However, that being said, um, in most cases, you want this to be out there. You want to talk and you want to say to, to, to judges or anybody who asks, hey, we have a standardized process. This is the way we do it every single time. We've done it in X amount of cases before and it's always been uh, blessed by the courts and everybody's agreed to it and it becomes really a, a great tool to control your, your uh, spend and to get kind of your way when it comes to how you're going to conduct e-discovery. You can say, look, this is, this is our plan. We've used it forever. We've had it blessed by outside counsel. We've brought in experts. This is how we conduct e-discovery at this company. Um, and so while it's not necessarily discoverable, um, the, the, the reality is you probably wouldn't care if it was uh, to a large extent because it's going to show that you've put a lot of thought and effort and process into it. And when anybody questions your process, um, even if you've made mistakes along the way, to show such an effort is going to go a long way with a judge or a magistrate who's looking at uh, looking at the sufficiency of the process. Um, let's see. Uh, would you share a link to the to the join a link to join blog postings? Yes. Um, it's uh, we'll we'll follow up with everybody. It's it's. Uh, um, Basically, it's our website, www.biprotect.com. I think it's just forward slash blogs. But if you go to our main website, up in the right-hand corner, there's a, 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 a direct link to the blogs and to other resources. Uh, and we will um, send around some information to everybody where you can find follow-up questions. Um, all right. Uh, we got four more questions left. So if, if you're all still there, <laughs> we'll answer them as, as quick as we can. Uh, the next question is, best practices for addressing accumulated e-discovery storage costs with a client, especially when on a pay-as-you-go plan with a cloud-based cloud e-discovery platform, um, also implementing firm protocols for maintaining ESI long-term. So this is uh, a question that was submitted to us um, uh, kind of before the process, and it's a great question because you know, one of the things that you can do to help prevent some of these long-term costs is to control the amount of data you're collecting in the first place. Uh, like we talked about the ESI, or, you know, targeted collections. Um, that's an important thing. For, for clients that have a lot of e-discovery um, and end up having large storage bills, uh, one of the most important things I think you can do is 
to look at this as not a one-off process, but again, just kind of part of daily business. Create those processes and and try to figure out what your usage is over the last year or two, and then work with a vendor and see if you can come up with uh, flat fee arrangements, bulk volumes. You know, we can like buying a a bulk volume to a certain amount of data storage or a certain amount of of uh, uh, um, online uh, storage, uh, be it Relativity or Catalyst or Reveal or Total Discovery or whatever solutions you're using, if if it's clear that you have this ongoing need and it's going to be something that's going to continually repeat, most uh, large rediscovery providers today will enter into long-term uh, um, bulk agreements, say you know 10 terabytes of, of a Relativity license for a three-year period. If you commit to that, uh, over a longer period, a lot of vendors will be able to give you significant discounts because you're making a long-term commitment and it's not a month-to-month -month thing. Uh, and so that's what I would say that one of the best ways you can kind of control those data storage costs. And also, to the extent you're storing data, one of the things you can do is, is audit it every once in a while and make sure that you're not storing data you don't need. Um, and, uh, and, and you can always pair off data if you, can, if you defensively show that it's not... Uh, uh, not um, not relevant. Uh, so, Barry, how about I throw this one to you? Please advise how best to document a defensible and repeatable e-discovery workflow. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, that too is a good question, and we we did discuss some of that. Uh, the the best way to document. Uh, your, your workflow is something that we do here at DIA, and that is develop a, a legal processes runbook that runs through um, all, all of your internal processes and um, identifies, again, legal event team, uh, your process with respect to litigation hold, your process with respect to collection of uh, data for the matter, how you process that data, how that, docu how that data is reviewed and Produced and as Brian was saying um, earlier, the ESI uh, protocol is a key part of that process. And again, in answer to one of the the earlier questions regarding the discoverability of that, um, having a runbook that um, is your guideline, your 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 guiding document that covers the principles that you follow for an e-discovery matter. Is, is something that, and it goes back to the theme of this presentation, is it will help you prevent wasted costs as you're going through the e-discovery process. And I, I think that um, that it, ha having a, a document which is available on the shelf, ready to go, if and when you face a litigation event, is, is something that will serve you and your organizations um, well, and it will pay for itself many times over. And uh, Barry, kind of a connected one to that um, a little bit, is what advice uh, would you give to a new e-discovery project manager when asked to propose an efficient workflow and savings for a new client matter? Uh, again, going back to planning is to have a, an outline of what the steps are as a project manager you need to address, and this would be, again, a subset to the runbook as to project kickoffs, what kind of outlines do you want to follow in order to start a project off on the right foot so that um, all the steps, again, are outlined and able to be followed. Um, we're a big proponent of checklists here at BIA, and that, that's one of the things we work with for our clients is to develop those checklists so that you're, you're starting at, at a point and you know what various steps you need to follow in order to get to a successful conclusion of a completed e-discovery um, effort. And the last question um, that we'll wrap up with is, what specific technological tools do you recommend throughout e-discovery for corporate legal departments and do they scale into other legal operational areas? Um, so, Full disclosure here, um, we use Total Discovery. Uh, Total Discovery got its start at BIA. We spun it off three, four years ago um, into its own organization, and now it's not, it's not owned by BIA. 
um, uh, individually anymore or, or, or really controlled by BIA, but it is still, you know, so I just wanted to sh be absolutely clear that there's a little bit of bias there because it was born here, but we still do think it's one of the best tools today um, out there. There are other tools as well uh, that you can use, uh, but the, the, we use the total discovery tool because it goes across the board. It's very remote. It's extremely easy to use. Uh, it can do everything from issue the first legal hold to, you know, collect data from just about anywhere uh, and, and filter that and, and then load it up into the review tool of choice. When it comes to review tools, of course, Relativity is by far, I think, the market leader out there and with good purpose. We also utilize uh, Catalyst for some uh, projects and also uh, um, Reveal's in-control solution is a great solution out there. Um, any of those review tools, you know, it really kind of depends on what the need is. There's, um, it's, the old saying is, everything looks like a nail if you just got a hammer. Um, you know, we believe, even with Total Discovery, uh, you know, where we obviously got a little biased, we use other tools as well to complement that. And, you know, it, it, there's, it's a very, very diverse world out there when it comes to data and resources. And when we first got in this industry, you know, you had to collect data from desktops and from email servers and from network shares and from backup tapes. And that was about it. Now you've got social media, you've got applications like Evernote and, and all sorts of other stuff. You've got, uh, um, unlimited kind of online storage solutions from Microsoft's OneDrive to Box to Google Drive to all sorts of other places. There can be data everywhere. And so the only way to handle that is to have a great deal of tools. But if you're inside of an individual organization, you know, there are behind the firewall tools you can install. Um, there are complete cloud solutions uh, like Total Discovery that you can do that don't require all that kind of installation. It really comes down to understanding the organization, uh, understanding the solutions that are there, and bringing somebody in with a little bit of experience with some various tools to be able to recommend um, individual solutions. The, um, when you talk about scaling to other legal operation areas, yes, that is actually something we see a lot. Um, and Again, I hate to continue to use Total Discovery every time, but with Total Discovery, one of the things a lot of our clients do who bought it originally for legal hold purposes um, are now starting to use the uh, notification and tracking and auditing and questionnaire uh, part of that. I mean, at the end of the day, what is a legal hold? It's an email notification to your employees telling them about a policy that they have to acknowledge that they got it and they understand it. What is the custodian questionnaire? It's a survey, right? So we have organizations who are starting to look at this and saying, hey, you know, we can use this solution to send out HR policy notifications, to send out computer use policy notifications, to ask our employees questions about, you know, some uh, under their, you know, their understanding of our security policies, all sorts of stuff like that. So you're seeing it used in regulation, in HR, in compliance, um, because at the end of the day, it's a great way for any type of communication where you need to be able to very clearly and easily track who got what when and did they acknowledge it and did you send reminders out. Um, it's an, and, and especially when we're talking about more and more concerns about data privacy and things like that, any solution like that, whether it's Total Discovery or Xterra or any other legal hold solution you got out there, um, you can use it for that kind of thing. And it, and it really, you know, um, uh, uh, starts paying dividends when you can spread that cost across the board. And the same thing with data collections, the right data collection technology. Um, we have clients who are using it for exiting employees. You know, when they have senior employees leave, um, they will oftentimes run a data collection against their resources so that A, their IT department can quickly um, uh, turn around and redeploy those assets to another employee. Uh, but more importantly, it's a great way to just say, okay, look, everybody who's a VP or above or in these types of positions or in sales or whatever the case may be, we're going to collect their data on their way out the door just in case there's something we want to look at later on. Um, and so we're seeing that tech, same kind of technology used in IT, in compliance, in regulatory uh, investigations, in all sorts of places. So yeah, absolutely, you're starting to see the legal technology be, be used across the board. Um, and, and Brian, let I don't me know if you step in for one, one point, um, if you don't mind. Um, I want to thank also ACEDS. That is, ACEDS is an excellent resource for uh, a lot of the information that we've been discussing here as well and particularly for project managers and people planning and needing to manage their, their legal um, requirements. 
So don't forget to utilize ASED's um, uh, library of, of knowledge. So uh, there's one last quick question, and this will take me a couple of seconds. How do you as a paralegal involve and keep your attorneys engaged in the data collection efforts? Um, so the, the easiest answer to that is tell them it's their ethical obligation, and if they don't pay attention to it, they could potentially face malpractice claims, um, because it is. Courts have very clearly stated, and especially California ethics decisions have come down placing, making it a, a, a potential ethics violations for attorneys not to pay attention to this stuff. Um, and so that's become a really, really interesting thing uh, that um, uh, uh, kind of something that's obviously very eye-catching. But at the end of the day, uh, how do you keep the attorneys focused on it? It's hard sometimes. I get that. They're focused on the legal issues and the legal arguments in the case. Um, the best way to do it is to have that plan in place where you can sit down and say, here's what we're going to do, and then you can go and implement the plan and focus on getting the work done. If you, you don't have to kind of check in. You don't have to go back and ask questions over and over as you get to each step. Put together that checklist. Have that plan in place. Have a you know quick meeting at the very beginning of a case to where you get started. And then you can control the collections based on the guidelines that have been set forward. So anyway, uh, I realize we've gone 15 minutes over, but we wanted to answer all the questions. I hope everybody got their questions answered. Um, I think that's the last of them. And uh, I guess, uh, Deja, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you so much for that excellent webinar, and thank you all for joining and, and attending. Um, this webinar will be on demand for all ASEDS members um, within the next 24 hours, and even if you are not a member, you'll be able to access it through the link that you use to join the session. Um, so thank you, and have a wonderful day.